Hey, welcome. You probably know that within the last 24 hours or so that there's a big meeting going on, and it's going to be on for about two weeks over there in Dubai. And the Pope is involved, and this has got a big religious component this time. So um, so I'm Larry Kirkpatrick. I'm here uh, in Michigan. I've got my friend Jay here in cyberspace. Uh, say hi, Jay. Hi, everybody. So uh, Jay's an attorney and a longstanding person of study, studying Bible prophecy. He's aware of history, and I try to be aware of history. So we're going to look at this and give sort of a commentary as we go through the, uh, the Pope and his comments. But first of all, actually, uh, let's just look at this real quickly from the the Secretary General of the uh, United Nations, he was telling us about uh, the climate problem. And let's see what he says. Climate change is here. It is terrifying. And it is just the beginning. The era of global warming has ended. The era, the era of global boiling has arrived. So that sounds pretty scary, Jay. Uh, is, is, this, is there a big fear thing going on? Or are people struggling with fear right now? Yeah, Larry, it's important to recognize that, that young people, especially this younger generation, have been fed this kind of rhetoric almost since their birth. And uh, in a 2021 survey of 10,000 people age 18 to 25, 75% of the young people said that the future is frightening regarding climate and that uh, 50% 50, 50 of survey respondents said they felt sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, guilty, all of those about climate change, four in 10 people uh, young people around the world are hesitant to have children as a result of the climate crisis. Um, and then there's you know, a really crazy stat out of France. 59% of those people, uh, as polled in 2023, between the ages of 18 and 24, think that you should be limited to four plane trips over your whole, whole life. And of course, this rhetoric, such as what you just heard from uh, the, um, the head of the, of the UN, is what's driving this. And... And they, these guys have heard this from their teachers and, and some of their religious leaders, and they're terrified. This this is dystopian. I mean, a lot of people, this is the only thing they've heard their whole life. I mean, that's unbelievable that uh, you can only be allowed four airplane trips in your whole life. And then four out of 10, you say, uh, in the statistics, four out of 10 are question whether they would even have children. Uh, no wonder we have some crazy problems. So the Pope, uh, actually filmed a short version of this, but he doesn't really add anything. And so we're, we're going to go with the, the notes that he actually sent his secretary to print uh, to, to present. And we're going to just comment on that. So let's show him as we uh, carry on. Your Highness, uh, Mr. Secretary General, dear brothers and sisters, uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, Dr. Hamad al Tayeb. Grand Imam of Al Hazar, who has assured me of his closeness, the Muslim Council of Elders, whom I met a year ago, the United Nations Environment Program, and all the partners who organized and supported this faith pavilion. It is the first of its kind at the heart of a COP, and it shows that all authentic religious beliefs are a source of encounter and action. So, Jay, what do you think about that authentic uh, religious beliefs? Is that, uh, is, is that everything we need to think about there? Right. So, Larry, at, this is the inauguration of the Faith Pavilion at COP28. And he's saying that this is unique. It's never happened before. And, of course, it's a big tent. That's what a pavilion is. And so you have all of these religious uh, representatives in this, in this meeting. And... He says it's the first of its kind at the heart of a cop, and it shows that all authentic religious beliefs are a source of encounter and action. Of course, what that brings to mind immediately is that um, everybody in the tent is what he's saying is has authentic religious beliefs. But what about the people outside the tent? By implication, there are people outside the tent. Not everybody subscribes to the same beliefs with respect to the climate narrative. What, but what about their beliefs? Are they authentic? Or are they inauthentic, which is, of course, the opposite of authentic? So are they fake? They're fake uh, religious beliefs, and and they're not a source of encounter and action. So I, I think that this raises some very interesting questions about the people who don't agree with him. And really, this is, uh, it's subtle, 
but it is othering the people who don't agree. Um, all religious, all authentic religious beliefs are a source of encounter and action. That leaves a significant amount of people uh, who don't agree with the pontiff on this subject outside of the tent. And um, you know, we've heard that kind of rhetoric throughout human history uh, regarding those who don't have authentic beliefs or they don't, they aren't worth protecting, um, they're not valuable. And, uh, and so that raises interesting questions. The other thing I would say just briefly is that um, obviously if you have um, if you have some beliefs that are authentic, which lead to um, encounter, what does that mean? That's, that's ecumenism. It's a reference to those people who come under the papal oversight and papal fraternity and um, an action, of course, is conformity to this this direction coming from the top, this supranational authority um, with respect to the common good. Yeah, yeah. Ecumenicalism is that word we get in, the, in English. We get that word from the Greek, the Greek of the New Testament that talks about the oikos. The house is the oikos. That's the Greek word for house. So ecumenical is means everybody's under the same roof. You're in the same house. And the papacy wants everybody to be under their roof, they're the legitimate, authentic representation of Christianity in their own eyes. And uh, But as you say, it's, it's a little bit subtle, and yet it's very important, very important. They're putting people in two groups. They're putting people in a group A or a group B. And if you're not in the authentic group, you're kind of automatically in the inauthentic group. And yes, as you say, uh, definitely, I agree with you quite a lot, the, uh, quite completely, that if you don't follow their prescribed story, their climate story, and their religious story as they see it, you're really in a different group, as you say, othering. Um, and they are othering people who are not uh, in their house. And I think we're going to see that play out stronger as we carry on through this presentation. Let's watch some more. Above all, encounter. It is important to see ourselves beyond our differences as brothers and sisters in the one human family and as believers to remind ourselves and the world that as sojourners on this earth we have a duty to protect our common home okay so uh what do you think about that boy it sure sounds like we're all one family there doesn't it yeah it sounds really good we all have our limits um we have to come together and um and we're not self-sufficient but then of course the narrative is that um we have to do something within this pavilion it's not just uh the tent this big tent that's being constructed is not just with respect to um you know praying to god and, and studying together this is about action and uh so so despite the fact that he talks about self-sufficiency and um and, and and that being a presumption uh of of people who want to do it themselves and save themselves yet um there's no call for um for christ to intervene here uh this is about coming together and doing something ourselves and it looks like self-sufficiency it looks like self self-righteousness, it looks like salvation-based or works-based salvation, I should say, Larry, and um, making an effort together to change this climate emergency that has arisen. Right, I, I think so. Um, it's interesting how there's so little individualism going on here, and it's all collective. Uh, we're all in this together. We're all in the same boat together, uh, one of the illustrations they're frequently using. You mentioned self-sufficiency. I think that's coming up in the next section. Religious, religions as voices of conscience for humanity remind us that we are finite creatures possessed of a need for the infinite. For we are indeed mortal, we have our limits, and protecting life also entails opposing the rapacious illusion of omnipotence that is devastating our planet. The, that uh, insatiable desire for power wells up uh, whenever we consider ourselves lords of the world, whenever we live as uh, though God did not exist, and as a result uh, end up uh, prey to passing things. Then 
Instead of mastering technology, we let technology master us. We become mere commodities, desensitized, incapable of sorrow and compassion, self-absorbed, and turning our backs on morality and prudence, we destroy the very sources of life. This is why the problem of climate change is also a religious problem. Its roots lie in the creature's presumption of self-sufficiency. Yet, without the Creator, the creature disappears. May this pavilion, for its part, become a place of encounter, and may religions always be welcoming spaces that witness to our need for the transcendent, speak of fraternity, respect and mutual care, and refuse to justify in any way the mistreatment of creation. So he says that uh, the problem of climate change is a religious problem. Is that is that true? Is that a big Bible? Is that a big Bible theme? Climate problem, uh, or do we we do find it in the Bible in some interesting places, don't we? It's interesting because, of course, there is a number of examples uh, with respect to climate change in the Bible, but almost universally, every time there's some sort of climate catastrophe, it's because people were sinful. Uh, but of course, you won't hear that being talked about at COP twenty eight. Uh, you won't hear about uh, worshiping idols or the sins of Sodom or anything like that. Um, but maybe we'll leave. No, that I don't think we'll time. hear about that. You know, the interesting thing though about the about Babel when it was built, Larry, is that Babel was built on the plain of Shinar, the city and the tower. And according to Josephus, the purpose of building Babel, which was Babylon, was to combat a potential climate emergency. It was to build a tower and a city that would help humanity escape another flood. So you'd have this big event that had just occurred in Genesis, and and God had said there would never be another flood to destroy the earth. But they said to themselves, no, we don't trust you. We don't believe you. uh, And and we're going to take steps to save ourselves. So again, you have workspace salvation. And for the purposes of climate change, and that is what is at the heart of building Babylon. And so there's a lot of people in the Christian world, and and uh, uh, you hear it all the time, that what's going on with respect to climate change and the coming together under this big tent has nothing to do with the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And yet, at the end of time, you have Babylon, you have the papacy, and you have the merchants of the earth, and you have the governments of the world all together building something. That's exactly right, Larry. And so in Genesis, the purpose for which Babylon was originally built, just let it sink in, was to combat a climate emergency. And Nimrod, whose name actually means rebellion, if you look it up in Strong's in Hebrew, um, was the architect of that. And according to some commentators, between 43 and 45 years, he managed to convince people that they needed to invest a substantial amount of time building this tower. And how did he get them to stay there and build it? He scared the living daylights out of them. Yeah, and it seems like we're building a new, uh, you know, whereas in, with previous to the Tower of Babel, you have the the, uh, the Noah and the Ark, Genesis 6 to 8. And there, God told Noah, gave Noah instructions, and Noah faithfully obeyed and built the Ark, and humanity was preserved by God, but but the Tower of Babel is man's attempt to preserve himself from God, you know, and so it's it's the opposite. It's kind of like an, an anti-arc, and um, and what we see now is the planet is uh, boiling, and, and so we've got to save ourselves, and we've got to uh, build our own Tower of Babel. We've got to, everybody's got to unite under one house, one roof, uh, one authority. And then we're going to uh, avert this climate crisis by our own human actions. And so the parallels there are, are I believe, I, I don't want it to be so, you know, but it's just as you say, uh, this is this is not the good parallel, Genesis 6 to 8, in a sense. This is the, this is the very negative parallel. This is a Tower of Babel parallel. Uh, and we're uniting, uniting everybody. I mean, God's, God divided the, the languages and the nations there in uh, Genesis 11, but this is again a uniting 
And when you unite, you have to be under one authority. And so uh, the, there's authentic religious beliefs, he said a little bit ago, and of course, implying inauthentic. Which one do we think is going to be uh, the, the legitimate, uh, viewed as a legitimate authority? It's everybody who's on, you know, the, the pavilion team, the big tent team, like you're talking about. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's there's a couple other interesting parallels, because, of course, God says there's there's never going to be another flood that destroys the earth. That's Genesis chapter nine. And then in Gen- Genesis eight twenty two, God says, until the earth remains, uh, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, cold and heat will remain. And so um, but but the people building this new Babylon, they don't believe that. Number one, they don't believe in God, most of them. They believe in evolution. They believe that if there was a God, that he has taken off and that we are left to our own devices. And uh, and really, that's a slander against the character of God. Um, you know, there's no way that the God of the Bible, who sent his son to die for humanity, is going to create humanity and then send his son to bear their sins and their penalty and then take off and allow the planet to be incinerated because people don't stop driving their cars. It's totally not biblical. Um, But the other interesting thing is, Larry, is that you have uh, on the planet Dura, you have Nebuchadnezzar also disobeying a direct instruction from God because Nebuchadnezzar was told, your kingdom is going to come to an end. It's going to give way to the Medes and the Persians. The next stage of that statue in Daniel chapter is not. I'm going to build myself a statue, and it's going to be all of gold because I am the head of gold. And then he compels everybody of every kindred, nation, tongue, and people to bow down and worship that image. And that's what's happening today. You have a gathering of every kindred, nation, tongue, and people in Dubai and the construction of this tower. And, you know, we know where Bible prophecy is is, is taking this. Um, so there's a lot of similarities. There are. There are. You know, it's interesting, too, that um, when you construct the Tower of Babel, you are basically assuming a human nature, which is different from the Bible described the way the Bible describes it. Um, human nature is fallible. Uh, we tend because of the, the fall. We tend towards self-service. Uh, you, we can't be trusted. Basically, that's why we have limited, limited government. America is built on that idea of limit, limiting, uh, limiting authorities, limiting powers. Uh, so that we kind of have boundaries there. Uh, but when you have a one world system, like these people are all coming together in uh, Dubai right now to kind of basically the UN and all this to, to move us into a space where there's enforceable on a global scale, enforceable rules and so on. Uh, this this is basically having a fanciful view of human nature that um, humans, if you give them the right education, if you uh, use the right force in the right way, if you put them under your thumbs in just the right way, if you squeeze them just the right way, you can shape them into the thing that they need to be. Humans are naturally good. They just need to kind of be be guided and pushed and squeezed and pushed over here. Uh, but that's not the uh, the Bible picture. But I think that's the picture of any one world government thing is you you reshape humanity into what you want. And uh, so this this is kind of more of that kind of a line, which kind of goes along with uh, the next phase. I think he's going to talk about education. Let's listen to that. This brings us to the other central theme of this pavilion and indeed of all religious belief, action. We need urgently to act for the sake of the vir- on the environment. It is not enough uh, merely to increase spending. We need to change our way of life and thus educate everyone to sober and fraternal lifestyles. This is an essential obligation for religions, which are called to teach contemplation, contemplation since creation is not only an ecosystem to preserve, but also a gift to embrace. A world poor in contemplation will be a world polluted in soul, a world that will continue to discard people and produce waste. A world that lacks prayer will speak many words, but uh, bereft of compassion and tears will only live off a materialism made of money and weapons. So he says here, uh, we need to educate everyone. Education is usually a good thing. 
but uh, but is there is there a, a something going on here more than just education? Yeah. So again, this is re-education or uh, indoctrination, like what happens in the school system, and and one of the reasons why kids are are terrified that they're never going to live to see adulthood. Um, and and again, it's it's re-education in the context of this common good fraternity. And every time you hear the the term the common good. You should ask yourself, do I get to say, do I get to have a say in what's what determines the common good? And the answer to that question, of course, is no, you do not. Whatever constitutes the common good is determined by somebody at the top. And uh, of course, we know that um, there's there's painful doctrine with respect to what constitutes common good. And and it's directly antagonistic to the principle of of individual rights. And um, and so, you know, there's lots of. Uh, discussion from Pope Francis all the time about how individualism is bad, nationalism is bad. Um, there needs to be a common good, uh, a recognition of the common good, uh, the good of the collective, and of course that is determined by uh, papal social doctrine. And you know that was at the root of the Reformation because you had the idea that you have somebody declaring what is truth. And then, and and a prohibition with respect to reading the Bible and determining what is truth for yourself. And so, if you disagree with the narrative, you are a heretic, and you were you you don't have authentic religious beliefs. You have inauthentic religious beliefs, and you can suffer persecution. Um, that's how Galileo ended up on under house arrest for the last seven years of his life because he disagreed with um, uh, with the doctrine of heliocentrism, and. Um, you know, there were lots of other people who who met similar fates and much worse, lost their property, lost their lives, etc. So the Western world is built on a principle which recognizes that humanity is given, is bestowed inalienable rights by the creator, not from the state, not from the church, but by the creator. And that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so whenever you hear a bunch of states getting together saying, well, some people have a right to live because they're authentic um, and, and you know, they have a right to be in the big tent because they're authentic and they agree with the collective. You know, you, it's, it, is, it, is a, it is a declaration that rights come from the state as opposed to from the creator. And so, uh, you know, it's really it's a clash of two ideologies. The, the system on which the Western world is built, which, which, is, which is, comes out of the Reformation, the recognition of individual rights. And then this other common good collective with an authoritarian power at the top. Yeah, you know, that's very interesting because uh, and even to subdivide it one notch further, uh, the American plan is we have inalienable rights, as you've just described it. Um, these rights are God given. But the European plan, uh, the French version of separation of church and state is laicity. And it is built on the idea that the state gives you the rights. The state tells you what rights you have. The state tells you what rights, religious rights you don't have. And so there's a there's a clean line there, a totally separate approach. And in Europe, uh, where we have, uh, you know, a, a lot of this one world stuff is emanating in that space. Uh, and of course, the papacy is there and so on. And that's where the, you know, the state dishes out what rights you have. But we... We understand from the Bible, though, that God is, because we're human, we're made in God's image. That's where our rights, uh, these rights come from. So you've made a very interesting point. And apparently they want to re-educate us um, away from God-given rights to, uh, they're going to educate everybody into the proper narrative, the proper line uh, that you must toe to be in the pavilion. Um, I think you're right. Now let's watch this next part here. We're near the end of the Pope's uh, comment. Uh, and so um, he's got one more paragraph here. Let's, let's listen to that. We recognize the extent to which peace and the stewardship of creation are interdependent. Before our very eyes, we can see how wars and conflicts are harming the environment and dividing nations, hindering a common home hindering a common commitment to addressing shared problems like the protection of the planet. A home is only livable 
when a climate of peace reigns within. So it is for our hurt, whose very soil seems to add its voice to those of the children and the poor who cry out to heaven, pleading for peace. Peacekeeping is also a task for the religions. Please let there be no inconsistencies in this regard. May our action not contradict the words we speak. May we not merely speak about peace, but take a stand against those who claim to be believers, yet fuel hatred and do not oppose violence. Here I think of the words of Francis of Assisi. As you proclaim peace with your lips, make sure that a greater peace is in your hearts. Brothers and sisters, may the Most High bless our hearts so that we may be together builders of peace and guardians of creation. Thank you. Well, now it's interesting. It started with uh, a recognition that there is an authentic group but now we see that we're to take a stand against those who claim to be believers, but they fuel hatred. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, that sounds like, in, in terms of the action, you said we need encounter and action. This sounds like, uh, looks like, like we're dividing between an authentic group, which was mentioned at the front, and an maybe an inauthentic group, which was implied, but not really mentioned. Is, am I, do you think I'm reading that right? I do, because there's a group of people he's saying who claim to be believers, i.e. they have religious beliefs. They have their perspectives, they have their beliefs, but yet they're not. They only claim to be believers, uh, but yet they fuel hatred and do not oppose violence. And when he says violence there, he's not talking about physical violence. If you look at 20, uh, at 2022, um, he talked to Argentina, uh, to the Argentinian government, and said that there needs to be um, a fifth category of crimes against peace. Uh, and these are ecocide laws to criminalize at the international level those conducts that involve the loss, damage, or destruction of flora and fauna. And so he's not just talking about, you know, people who are violent against humanity, uh, although I think in the context of what he's reading, that's a, that's a, that, that might be part of it. But these people who claim to believe, and yet um, they're, they're not authentic believers, um, they are people who don't go along with the climate narrative. That's what he's saying. And, um, and so, uh, you know, again, you have this marginalization of people who don't share the same beliefs, we saw a leader of the Western world say during the lockdowns uh, with respect to people who hadn't gotten a shot, shall we tolerate these people? And this kind of language historically often leads to um, leads to prison camps and genocide and things like that. It's the othering of people. That's how it starts. You create a distinction. You other them. You marginalize them. You begin to progressively take away their rights. And then at the end of the day, um, you know, you deprive them of, of, uh, of constitutional rights and civil liberties and, and they're, they're punished. And um, so, I mean, it's a very serious thing, Larry. You know, you, you and I, I think both sound like somebody who we, we probably sound like somebody who sort of suspects we're going to be othered. <laughs> uh, and uh, if this, if this, uh, as this proceeds, if it does, uh, so yeah, he wants people to take a stand against against those who claim to be believers. But uh, now there's another document here that he refers to in the middle of, uh, of his comments, and he, there's a link to it. You refer to it. You get this off the Vatican website. It's called the Document on Human Fraternity for World Peace and Living Together. This is a 2019 document. So this is this is BC. You know, this is before COVID. Uh, um, but uh, I've got a copy of that here, and I think you and I both looked at this a little bit as well. And uh, we I don't think we want to plow into the whole piece, but um, as we looked into this document, uh, we noticed not too far into the document something interesting here. And we don't have video for this, so we'll just have to read it or, or drop it on the screen. But um, there's a line here, and I want to just read it to you, and maybe you can comment on it. 
on the second line, like third or fourth paragraph in, uh, they're going through in the name of this, and the name of that, and the name of orphans, and so on. Uh, we want to do these things. So I'm going to read this line to you. This is from the document that the Pope signed in combination with basically the pastor of the biggest mosque in Cairo, this nine from the year 972, this uh, very significant mosque. Anyway, here's what here's what the document says. In the name of innocent human life that God has forbidden to kill, affirming that whoever kills a person is like one who kills the whole of humanity, and so on he goes. But um, it's interesting here that there's a distinction. Uh, am, am I reading too much into this? But why does it say in the name of innocent human life? Is this just about uh, abortion thing? Is that a, a Muslim thing? Is this is, is he making a line um, of innocent and not innocent? Yeah, so it's not you shouldn't kill and all human life has value. It's in the name of innocent human life. Now, what if you're a peaceful uh, person? Um, you love your country. Um, you've always you pay your taxes. You follow the laws of the land. Um, you're nonviolent. You, you go to church, right? Or you don't go to church, but you don't believe in the climate narrative, and um, you don't believe that the planet is going to be incinerated if we don't stop driving our cars, or um, you don't believe in in uh, you know things like. Things like a universal Sunday law, which has been proposed in Laudato Si. Um, in the name of innocent human life that God has forbidden to kill. Well, God, I mean, is, is that how the Ten Commandments are framed? Um, thou shalt not kill innocent people? Who determines if they're innocent or not? And isn't that a reference to due process? What process is there to determine whether or not you're innocent or not? If you have views that are um, that are different then the people in the big tent, are you still innocent? Or are you are you some sort of a criminal? Um, because you don't believe in the climate narrative. You don't believe in climate boiling. So I think that these are questions that when you read these documents, uh, certain things jump out at you. Yeah, well, as I read through here, I see a lot of uh, human fraternity, fraternity, fraternity. It's all over the place. And when you look it up, you know, in the... Uh, in the Catholic Catechism, and see what they say about it. what's the, what is what is fraternity in Catholic speak. Uh, fraternity means uh, basically it's talking about these uh, duties that we allegedly have towards one another. And I, I and I do believe we should treat each other, you know, and, and treat families and, and treat people with every kind of dignity. Uh, I, I agree, but but the thing is that who decides what's for t for who's in the fraternity. <laughs> who decides, as we saw in the, the Pope's comments here yesterday or this morning, um, what is the authentic, um, uh, who's in the authentic pavilion and who's who's not in the authentic. So there's lots of fraternity here. I won't read all this. Uh, there's about six or seven pages in this document. There sure is a lot in here about uh, religious extremism, fanatical extremism, and um, and some stuff about the environment, but mostly it seems like it's talking about um, this sort of this question. And remember, this is 2019. It's talking about this question of who's, who is authentic and what do we do about the religious extremists? And um, like, here's a line here on page four of this thing. We can, we can confront tendencies that are individualistic, selfish, conflicting, and also address radicalism and blind extremism in all of its forms and expressions. Well, you know, I don't think you and I are for extremism, but what if we get placed, what if we get othered and placed in that extremist camp? Here's another line. Uh, moreover, we resolutely declare that religions must never incite war, hateful attitudes, hostility, and extremism. So a religion must never incite hostility or extremism. Well, who's the judge? of whether what I say or what you say is, is hey, you know, that what you said is, that's hostile. Who's the judge of that? Yeah, where, where, where's the process? Like, who's determining this? Where's the safeguards? And so, like extremism, we associate that with people who are violent. And, um, you know, but, but you know that people who say that they believe the word of God um, and that it's a fundamental part of their faith. Those people have been termed uh, fundamentalists. 
And uh, Pope Francis said in 2014 that if you think that you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's dangerous if you want to do it apart from the church. And so, again, this is, you know, this is the big tent. There is an authority here that's being claimed. And that's secret. I mean, Pope Francis claims authority as Christ's representative on earth, that he has spiritual and temporal authority. Um, uh, this is this is something that, that is well known with respect to the popes of Rome. And, um, you know, that's why that's why the head of the Catholic Church is in Rome, because Rome was the head of the world. And so the claim is, um, I think it was from Pope Pius XI in 1929, who said that the reason why Rome is the head of the Catholic Church is because Christ put it there to show the world that this is still the capital of the world. And that's why he put the capital of, of the Catholic Church there. So, you know, there is a claim to authority. And the question is, 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 is there room for a difference of opinion? Because in, in the free world, in the Western world, you have a right to your own thoughts, your own opinions, your free speech, your right to associate, your right to gather, your right to study, your right to proselytize. And, you know, Larry, I don't, I don't want to go into it too much, but, you know, that brings up an interesting point about proselytization, because this is a document between the papacy, representatives of, the, of Islam, um, you know, but is this going to all the world and preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Like, is, this, is this what the papacy is doing in this document? There's no mention of Christ, uh, preach the gospel in all the world, and then, and then the end shall come. I mean, is, is that what's in here? No, that's and so not this is, that. and so that, you know, that is one of the things that's so alarming about this, I think. The whole thing is that you have a group of people who are being told that the planet is going to incinerate itself, which is, like I said, it's a slander against the character of God because God is sovereign over this earth, according to the scriptures. And to say that, um, that if we don't save ourselves, Really, that's an insult to God because the Lord died for humanity. He loves people. He loves every person on this earth, and he is watching. And um, that's what the scriptures say. And that should be the message that's going to all the world, that, that Jesus died for humanity and, uh, and that he's made a way for, for eternal life. Um, but that's nowhere in this dialogue. No, it doesn't really seem to be that. There's one more piece here I want to bring up. This, Remember, I think what we're quoting from here is called A Document on Human Fraternity uh, for World Peace and Living Together, this six- or seven-page document. Uh, in the last two pages, there's a couple of calls that uh, to make international legislation, international agreements, uh, to take and implement these things in legislative texts. But anyway, I want to read one other piece here in this one last piece to get your comment on it. This is the paragraph on terrorism. So this is the 2019 document. And uh, of course, we're all against terrorism. But I'm thinking about how the Pope began his document that was just published yesterday or today with the authentic people who are in the pavilion. <laughs> um, I think reading this paragraph is important for us to let me read it and see, uh, see if it's, is it possible that you or I or others who might hold beliefs that possibly aren't quite the same as the Catholic belief on uh, the Pope's belief on climate change. Is it possible that, well, let me read it and see if we think that maybe somebody might, might decide we fit in this category, but let me read it, read it out here and get your reaction. Terrorism is deplorable and threatens the security of people, be they in the East or the West, the North or the South, and it disseminates panic, terror, and pessimism but this is not due to religion. Even when terrorists instrumentalize it, it is due, rather, to an accumulation of incorrect interpretations of religious texts and to policies linked to hunger, poverty, injustice, oppression, and pride. This is why it is so necessary to stop supporting terrorist movements fueled by financing the provision of weapons and strategy and by attempts to justify these movements, even using the media, all these must be regarded as international crimes that threaten security and world peace. Such terrorism must be condemned in all its forms and expressions. So 
generally speaking, yes, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not in favor of terrorism, but I thought that line was, what did you think of that line? Uh, this terrorism is not due to religion. It's due rather to an accumulation well, here's, here's, of incorrect interpretations of religious texts. And if you're not under the in the pavilion, maybe he would feel like we don't have the right interpretation of the text on this or that topic. This, the thing about the thing about laws and the rule of law specifically is that you're supposed to have clearly defined laws that people are aware of, and that that helps safeguard their rights and it helps show the state where the limits of its authority are. And so when you start having loosey-goosey uh, definitions or no definitions about words, um, like we would all say terrorism is bad, you know, but you would not say in the Western world that if you disagree with somebody peacefully that that's terrorism, that's a disagreement, and it's entirely legal in the Western world. In most places, disagreement is legal. This is where disagreement is not, where not legal are authoritarian regimes where tyrants hold power. And so um, to say that, to redefine terrorism, somebody who has incorrect interpretation of religious text raises all sorts of, of questions because, um, you know, millions of people were put to death during the dark ages because somebody felt like they had an incorrect interpretation of religious text. That was the whole purpose of the Inquisition. That was the whole purpose of the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, which was a, a, uh, a list of banned books maintained by the Inquisition. You know, and John Milton and, and, uh, and, a, and a host of philosophers, Galileo, um, had their works banned. Yeah. So, I mean, there's been a call repeatedly from the papacy and from certain governments, you know, big tech, but there's been collusion between governments and big tech uh, to censor so-called disinformation or misinformation. And yet a lot of the time that information has turned out to be true. Uh, you know, so that's concerning. Um, but going back to the point about, um, going back to the point about incorrect interpretations of religious tech, uh, certainly Inquisition has said every single Protestant um, under this definition, was a terrorist. You know, but William Tyndale translated the Bible into the English language. It was prohibited to do that, and he was and he was uh, he was strangled and then he was burnt simply for for the act of translating the Bible. And there were lots and lots of Protestants. You know, Martin Luther disagreed with with a host of things um, about the, the the mainstream Orthodox narrative. Um, you know, is Martin Luther a terrorist under this de definition? I think hey, it, Martin, I think that this is one of the principles in the West. I was going to say, if Martin Luther was with us today, do you think he do you think he'd get a ticket and go and go to the uh, go to Dubai and, and hang out over there? Yeah, I mean, Martin Luther might might hang out and might hang a document on the wall of the pavilion uh, to, <laughs> to protest, you know, <laughs> un unbiblical statements that are taking place in the context of that meeting. But, you know, it just raises the question, Larry, in the Western world, we have these guards and they come out of a, a centuries, many centuries legacy of persecution and blood. They were built on the persecution and the execution of millions of martyrs. And so, you know, the Western world needs to think very carefully about rolling back the safeguards that protect individual rights for the sake of what a centralist collectivist organization says about about the common good there's there's real scary consequences to doing that yeah yeah i've got a book here um called the great controversy and i believe this was on the catholic uh, index of banned books until that index was was discontinued i can't remember if it was discontinued in 62 or 63 or 1969 or 1968 at one time I remembered, but um, yeah, it, this doesn't seem like it would fit maybe within the uh, the pavilion. Uh, I wonder what will happen if, if we'll come to a spot where you can't get these books again, but they're not allowed to be sold uh, because somebody doesn't like, you know, what's in the book, uh, doesn't fit the narrative. But uh, yeah, we're, we're at a very interesting crossroads 
in history, I think. Uh, and just to kind of finish off here, um, kind of, I, I'd like to come back around uh, where we began in this conversation with um, the, the thought, the, the recognition that, that millions and millions of young people uh, scattered across the planet, uh, lots of young people are being uh, told or they, at least they feel after this uh, continuous inculcation of fear, fear. And now this, the UN uh, leader guy is saying, uh, we've passed from climate change and to now we're in climate boiling. Well, I remember when I was in high school, uh, 100,000 years ago, uh, I remember the, the big concern was uh, we were going to go to a big ice age. That was what they were teaching us. Uh, we, hey, we've got to got to figure this out. We got to get the science nailed down because we might be going into a new ice age. Well, that's not quite the same as we're boiling. But uh, anyway, I, I want to come back to that, though, because I think we want to finish off with a word of hope. And maybe you kind of started on that a minute ago. Uh, how should how should people yeah. relate to this? Do we uh, is this just automatically true because the Pope says it and the scientists allegedly say it and the uh, polit political leaders say it? Uh, should we, I don't know, uh, what, what, what approach should we take uh, when we are told these things and so much so that we're afraid to have children? Uh, somehow that seems absolutely exactly contrary to Genesis 1 and 2. Maybe you can kind of uh, give us a word of hope here before we, and then we'll just finish. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people. Um, I think there's millions of young people, and they've grown up instead of sandboxes and and uh, and trucks and and tire swings. They've grown up with climate Barbie, uh, you know, and and the constant fear mongering. And I know for a fact, I know people, I know young people who they're terrified of the future. And and the word of God is a promise to every single one of us. That's God's word to you personally. So if you're worrying about whether or not the planet is going to incinerate, uh, um, you know, Genesis 8.22 says, from God to you, to every single person on this planet, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, cold and heat shall not cease. So this planet supports life and it continues to support life until the end and um you know according to the scriptures we never get to to climate boiling and we never get to the point where the air is unbreathable um which is some of the you know the irresponsible rhetoric that's being thrown around by people at cop 28 amen uh it's true uh, god will finish this thing uh in righteousness and uh uh, we can all read Revelation 18 and find out that uh, there are a bunch of people that are under one roof. Uh, they're in one house. And in Revelation 18, the first four or the first eight verses tell us what happens to the people uh, in that house. And we're also told in the Bible we're not to have a, a spirit of fear, but of, of right, you know, a sound mind. We're to we're to lay hold of we're to lay hold of trusting in God. And no, that doesn't mean we should just go out and just cut down trees and destroy everything in sight. You know, we might have checked out a chainsaw to destroy everything. None of us here have been a big plan to destroy everything. But but uh, the promise remains that God will be with his people. God's not going to let this ravel out into nothingness. And so I appreciate your right. word of hope for us there. Yeah. yeah, Larry, if I could just say, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear. And so the spirit of fear does not come from him. And uh, he said he'd never leave us or forsake us. Amen. And that's a good note for us to end on. Well, there's going to be another week and a half or so of this climate business uh, over there. And I'm sure we'll hear more uh, more things. <laughs> and, um, but onward we go. And uh, we are blessed. We have the word of God. We know that God loves us. And he wants us all in the kingdom. He designed us to even have some of us even have children. So uh, let us keep on in uh, in God's direction. Thank you for joining me and uh, everybody who's joined in. I hope this has been uh, giving you food for thought, uh, food for thought, but not maybe not fear, but maybe some hope. Uh, God is still on his throne. God bless each one.